to all of you unconventional conventionists. Welcome back to Rocky Talkie, where a Rocky Horror Podcast that talks about anything. And I cannot stress this enough, everything Rocky Horror. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. We're joined by Fred Moreau, RKO's original asshole. Hi, Fred. Hello, Fred. Aaron and I are thrilled that we could talk with you today. We are both big fans of all the work that you do, but for those of our listeners who may not be as intimately familiar with your contributions as we are, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your 25 years being part of the Rocky Horror community? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, So I've been involved with Rocky, like you said, for 25 years. I've started out on lights. Um, I started out as an audience member, actually, and then got brought into the show by the cast director at the time. And then I started out on lights, moved my way onto the stage. I was cast director for a while for a previous cast that was not RKO Army for a short period of time. And basically, I do whatever's needed as far as RKO goes. Um, We don't really have titles. I just do whatever crops up that needs help. Jack of a million trades. A million. (laughs) Master of none. (laughs) Well, I think that's an understatement. So thank you so much for joining us today. We are super excited to have you on air. Now, before we get started with the show, we'd like to take a moment and ask each other, how was your week? Did y'all get up to anything fun? It's been a busy week over here. I mean, we have seen so many shows this last week, non-Rocky shows and Rocky shows at the end of last week. Um, We saw a ton of stuff on Broadway. We've got a ton of stuff on Broadway we're seeing next week. Uh, We just went and saw one of our uh, cast members uh, had her first play uh, that she wrote that just got its premiere. So just the other day, a couple of of folks went and saw that uh, with us. It was fantastic. Great to go out, support your local cast members and all of the endeavors that they're doing where they're not running around on stage naked. Um, so that was Boring. super fun. I know, <laughs> but, uh, it was, it was a good time. Every, everybody had fun. We were hanging out lots of hanging out, lots of, lots of just chilling with people this week. Uh, it was, it's been pretty good. How about, how about you, John? What have you been up to? Sheesh. What have I been up to? So this past week, actually somebody who, um, I very much cherish and value as a person has flown in to New York City. It is her first time in the States. It is her first time in New York City. And she is staying with myself, Savannah, and Adam for about a month. And my first week has kind of been nothing but acclimating her to the city, acclimating her to the, you know our living space. Uh, and she has absolutely loved everything so far. We've done a lot of shit. We've done some touristy stuff. We've done some off the beaten path things. I took her to her first Broadway show. We went to go see Moulin Rouge. Next Ooh. week we're seeing uh, Beetlejuice and Hades Town. Nice. Uh, took her, you know, on the Staten Island ferry. We went to Juniors. Uh, you know, we're we're doing everything that there is to do. Uh, today is kind of like our low key day because we are streaming later. Both of us are streaming later, but it has been literally nothing short of fantastic. Uh, she went to Rocky last night with us a sold out show sat right in the front uh she got degraded in front of the audience it was fantastic it's it's been absolutely wonderful uh she's actually passed out behind me right now poor thing's exhausted but uh it's been it's been great it's been great and uh i couldn't be happier all right you got all the new york uh, stuff done time to act like a real new yorker sit in your apartment and order seamless yeah that's exactly what we're doing we're we're streaming tonight she's actually never had taco bell before because they don't get it in her country so <laughs> after we're done this we're actually going to go to taco bell and order some taco bell and we're gonna pop her taco bell cherry on stream tonight it's gonna be great i'm so sorry in advance <laughs> <laughs> what about you fred what have you been up to this week Oh, well, we went hiking. Um, We got a seasonal waterfall in the vicinity of where I live. Even though I'm close to Boston, um, we're surrounded by a lot of parkland. So we went hiking and checked that out. So that was fun. And then um, got back from that and decided to start working on cleaning out my castle hotel. I mean, uh, my dungeon. I mean, my basement. (laughs) Just trying to get a whole bunch of stuff that's just been piling up over the years down there, out of there. And uh, yeah, it, it's been an adventure. 
any good Rocky stuff? Should I should I be checking your eBay account sometime soon? <laughs> Just you know, inquiring minds uh, want to know. I, ironically, I did find a package from Sal from a convention, so I got to go through that. Um, I found some old dog tags from the RKO Con 2016 convention. Oh, cool. And then I, I found some old um, costume pieces from when we did Evil Dead 2 that I got to pull up out of the basement and then just put in a closet somewhere so they're not getting musty. All right, my checkbook is ready. <laughs> well, <laughs> with all of that out of the way, let's dive into our first segment. It's a global news. Wahoo! <laughs> First up in global news, everyone's favorite slut is about to grace us all with some screen time in a new multi generational rom com titled Maybe I Do. The film stars Emma Roberts and Luke Bracey as a young couple who are questioning the next steps in their relationship. The two decide to turn to their parents for guidance and invite both pairs over to ask how their marriages are working out. As it turns out, all the parents, played by Diane Keaton, Susan Sarandon, Richard Gere, and William H. Macy, all already know each other very well, and cinematic hijinks ensue. Ooh. Oh, shit, guys. We're all thinking the same thing here, right? Right? Orgy. Definitely orgy. There's literally nothing else it could possibly be. Damn. Like, maybe this is what Susan was alluding to in her tweet. Like, do y'all remember that? Wait, what? I must have missed that one. Yeah, a, a couple of weeks ago, somebody tweeted about how it was such a shame that Susan Sarandon doesn't play sluts on screen anymore. Which, I mean, Susan obviously is going to respond to that. So she retweeted and commented that, quote... There's still time. Ooh. I would literally pay fives of my dollars to watch Susan get touch a touch a touch by William H. Macy. I mean, we all would, buddy. We all would. Well, maybe we can. This movie was just announced a few days ago, and as of now, there's no official release date, but it sounds like a really fun big budget rom com. So we'll probably get to check it out sometime over the summer. Okay, so serious question time. As seasoned veterans of RKO Cons 1, 2, and 3, basic math dictates that we've all partaken in at least seven orgies apiece. Yeah, that tracks. And anyone who's been involved in at least a few of them knows that every orgy has a weak link. Someone who doesn't quite hold up to the other participants. So I gotta ask, between Diane Keaton, Susan Sarandon, Richard Gere, and William H. Macy, who is the weak link in that orgy and why? Ooh. Hmm. That's a tough one. Well, I googled some uh, Richard Gere quotes, and I'm pretty sure that he's the weak link here. Let me just, uh, let me just throw some of these out there. Quote, <clears throat> My life is pretty simple and normal. So, obviously, simple and normal. Not, not what I'm looking for at my orgy. But even more telling... He once said, <clears throat> the secret of my success is my hairspray. And as anyone knows, hairspray makes an absolutely terrible lubricant. So, Richard Gere, get the fuck out. Sorry. Room's full. Yeah. Uh, we're at capacity. Uh, for me, it's it's going to be Richard Gere. Richard Gere is 100% the weakest link in that orgy. Um, I do think that on the opposite spectrum that William H. Macy is going to be the surprise underdog of the orgy. I think that William H. Macy can last extremely long and 100% knows what he's doing with his hands. So like he may come a little bit early, but he can still partake over and over again because he's very, very good with his large monkey hands. And I think that both Diane Keaton and Susan Strandon are very much in the center. They they know what to do. They get the job done. They have a great time, and then they leave. <laughs> All right. Factual. Factual. Lots of it. You can't argue with any of that. What was he in? I got to scroll through this. Who, who, William H. Macy? Yeah. Fargo? Yeah. Shameless? <sighs> Pleasantville? Didn't he do... Who did the whole... Oh, no. I'm thinking of somebody else. He was in The Cooler. No. Nice to meet you. <laughs> no. He plays a... Uh, uh, like a down on his luck gambler. Uh, William who... H Macy playing somebody who's down on his luck. That never I know, happens. Right? 
But here's the funny, the best thing is he is constantly paid by uh, this casino to go in and be bad luck at the table games. <laughs> He's the cooler. <laughs> he goes in and he ruins people's luck. So maybe, maybe I'm going to have to change my answer because like he has professional experience ruining things that are going well. So... Counterpoint, Richard Gere put a gerbil up his butt. You know, you can't confirm that. I mean, South Park, while accurate, might have flubbed some facts there. What do you think, Fred? Who's the weak link here? William H. Macy. Jurassic Park 3, that's all I got to say. (laughs) (laughs) We don't talk about Jurassic Park 3. (laughs) Bad sequels, velociraptors, what more can I say? Bad orgy. Bad orgy. (laughs) Welp, hands up if you can't wait for this movie to drop so we can see if all our predictions come true. I have all seven of my hands raised right now. (laughs) God damn it, John. Well, with that, let's move on over to some community news. So first up in community news... A few weeks ago, we chatted with you all about JCCP's upcoming crossover event with the legendary Baltimore cast Chocolate-Covered Rocky Horror, which will take place over Pittsburgh Pride Weekend on June 4th at the Hollywood Theater. But just this week, Chocolate-Covered Rocky Horror announced that they're planning to turn the weekend into a double feature. The cast will be performing in Pittsburgh on the 4th, and on June 5th, will be teaming up with the Sonic Transducers based out of Washington, D.C., to bring the Rocky Horror 60s show to Baltimore. Think Rocky Horror meets Hairspray, sure to be a humorous, soulful, and sexy experience. The production will take place on Sunday, June 5th at 7 p.m. at the Baltimore Soundstage. Tickets are only $30 for a single, $25 each for two or more, or $35 if you're lazy and you pay at the door. If you happen to be in either the Pittsburgh or D.C. area for the first weekend in June, we highly, highly recommend that you guys check out one of these shows. Chocolate Covered Rocky Horror is a fabulous cast that's known for putting its own creative spin on all of their performances. We're also thrilled to add that if you happen to live in or around the D.C. area, catch the show and love what you see on stage, Chocolate Covered Rocky Horror is currently recruiting new members. According to their website, right now they're in the market for actors, vocalists, models, dancers, and technical crew. So just about everyone. For more information on CCRH's hometown performance with the Sonic Transducers, their Pittsburgh show with the JCCP, or their recruiting process, you can head over to earlorin.com, or you can check out the link in our show notes. And before we close out community news, we just want to give all of our lovely listeners a reminder that two of your RKO convention masters, Creature Feature and Ricky Mortis, are still looking for submissions for the convention's drag race event. If you're interested in performing a drag number at the event, all you have to do is fill out the form on the RKOCon.com website with all your particulars, your drag name, your performance genre, the best way to tip you, that sort of thing. You don't even have to have your performance numbers picked out yet. As long as you were able to get your final song selections sent over to the showrunners by like early June or early July at the very latest, you're golden. If you have any questions about how the show will work, the submission process in general, your costumes, where babies could... Pretty much anything, really. Definitely reach out to Creature Feature or Ricky Mortis, and they'll be thrilled to answer any and all of your questions. So this is actually a brand new segment for ArcheoCon, and we are all super excited to see everyone's bomb-ass performances and to see the show do well as a whole. So if you are on the fence about submitting, please... Consider this sign to take the plunge and show us what you've got on stage. We promise we'll all be cheering you on and not making fun of you behind your back. I'll make fun of you in front of your back. Exactly. I'll make (laughs) fun of you. I'll make fun of you in front of your ass. Well, that's behind your back, isn't it? we'll, We'll all do it with a bunch of shots in our hands, so it'll be fun as hell. I'll do it with my penis in my hand. God damn it, John. We just talked about orgies. <laughs> well, I want to talk about them again. <laughs> so who's organizing the one after the drag race? I don't know. That sounds like a You con. just volunteered. I still oh. have seven of my hands up. God. Propose something, get the action item. <laughs> it would be nice if we had an orgy after the drag race event, Roy. <laughs> 
don't think that's an officially sponsored event. <laughs> Nay. <laughs> And of course, all the deets as well as the submission form can be found at rkocon.com. All right, Fred, we know that as one of the con runners, you are totally and completely impartial and you love every single piece of the con equally. But is there like secretly deep down a con event that like you're looking forward to even just the teensiest bit more than the others? Maybe the orgy? I mean, we promise we won't tell. <laughs> oh boy that's a tough one um so i'll say uh, i mean number one it'd be nice to see people again right that's what this is all about is just getting people together get getting to see other people in the community that's going to be huge i mean that that's the event for me what i'm looking forward to seeing is the drag event i think that's going to be awesome and it's just breaking new ground. And, you know, we want to cast a wide tent here in the community and let people just strut their stuff. Absolutely. I mean, that's the same reason that I'm super excited to see Reefer Madness and, and Hedwig, right? Like new Amen. things that we haven't really seen before. Like sign me up for that shit. The new stuff just makes the, con and it makes every convention a new convention. So it's like, oh, I've, I've, I've done a convention before. Yeah, but this is different. Absolutely. Transition into FAC. God damn it, John. <laughs> here, here, I got you. Oh, it's stage directions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you two. I'm pretty sure that everyone out there can guess what we're going to be talking about for today's FAAQ segment. Fred asks a question. Is it tacos? I've got a million questions about tacos. I'm having Taco Bell in like two hours. We can talk about tacos. It's not. Mr. Taco it's... is the best place, but it closed. <sighs> it's not tacos. It's in, not in, tacos. In, 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 in fact, it's not even Fred asks a question. But it's an FAAQ segment. No, no, no. This week we're doing Fred answers a question. I fucking hate you. That's right, you do. This week, we're talking all about merch. That delicious, delicious cast creative outlet, moneymaker, branding opportunity, and so, so much more. <laughs> you guys have talked about some of this stuff before, but in the past, you've almost exclusively covered officially licensed merch or mass market professionally produced items. Today, we're going to dig in a little deeper and talk about merch at your local cast level. We are talking about all of those items that your cast might sell before your show or at an event where you've booked a booth or just that sweet stuff that you want to show off at RKOCon to let everyone know that you are part of the coolest cast in the country. Hell yes. I love this topic. I'm so excited we have Fred on here to talk about it. Here's a here's a little quickie to get us started, okay? Uh, yeah, that exactly that long. Yes. <laughs> So what was your guys' like first Shadowcast produced merch item that like you might have been at a show and you saw it and were like, shit, I have to have that? Was it like a shirt or a button, maybe a poster or something else entirely? And John, don't fuck me on this. You better have an answer. Um <laughs> Shadowcast produced merch item. Why do you got You know I don't give a shit about this. Um <laughs> I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I know that this might sound like a cop-out, but it's entirely fucking true. I think that one of the most genius merch ideas to ever come out of a Rocky Horror cast is actually the NYC RHPS shirt, the I Heart New York, but the heart's the lips. I, yeah. I think about that like at least once a week. You're and welcome. I'm and it's I think it's also because I live in New York City, so I'm overwhelmed with I Heart New York stuff, and especially you know dragging my friend around the city for the past week. There's a lot of variations of that brand of that idea, but honestly, I think that the the I Heart New York with the heart being the lips stands out to me. Uh, I have like four versions of this shirt. I don't know why. I'm pretty sure I did not buy any of them. <laughs> 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 Meg kicks me off cast for stealing Rocky for NYC or HPS merch. But I really like when I was on, like when I wasn't on cast and I was just like going to the show over and over again, that was kind of the thing. That, like, that was the thing. I was like, I feel like I've made it when I own that piece of merchandise. Did you know we didn't actually even have that shirt until about 20 years ago? Really? Mm-hmm. We, wow. we had never done it. And then, um, 
Jen, uh, Deadly Sting, who does all the yes. wonderful Frank tattoos, uh, her and I uh, pitched that one to Madman Mike at the time, and he was like, absolutely, let's go ahead and do it. And we spent a ton of time getting the font exactly incorrect enough that we couldn't get sued over it. <laughs> and it was, it was probably – it's so simple. It's one of those like, oh – it's such low hanging fruit. Why in God's name hadn't we done it before? And right. I, it, it, everybody likes it. I, it's one of the best selling shirts that we've ever had. And yeah, I, it's absolutely one of my favorites. Yeah. What about you, Fred? Like whatever it is, I'm sure Aaron would offer you his firstborn child if you ever wanted to put it up on eBay. <laughs> so uh, our old venue. This is goes back to even before officially RKO Army. This is like RKO players and absolute pleasure players the first cast roy was involved with we had a home theater in warwick rhode island for years called the meadowbrook theater and i believe it's still true to this date it's the longest running theatrical production in rhode island history at like something like 648 weeks straight so they had a week 500 t-shirt and i was like i've got to have it so of course you know we we grabbed that and you know I still have it in my closet. There was a week 600 shirt as well, but it's it's 500 sounds better than 600. And it always reminds me too. Somebody brought 500 rolls of toilet paper to the show for the 500th show. So then you saw okay, you can stand on a pile of 500 rolls of toilet paper and be about six to seven feet off the ground <laughs> and not sink into it. It's it's amazing. Oh. Oh, that's fantastic. It really was something special. It was it was just an amazing night. It was packed. You know, they, they had a bunch of interviews. It got picked up in the local paper. It was awesome. And got to love those, like, the commemorative, you know, shirts and things for that that are, like, for a specific event. It brings you right back to where you were at then, you know, when you bought it, when you saw it. You know, it helps, you, it helps that memory, you know, stick around. Mm-hmm milestone yeah so aaron what you thinking two three hundred bucks all yours if the price is right and the weiss is tight you're fired all right y'all who are listening to this fucking podcast know damn well that i would have never fucking said that as a reaction it's a script i'm supposed to say the words okay right now all right so first march item um hmm if John had kicked it to me better, I would have had more time to stall. Um, <laughs> I live for putting you in the, the hot and sexy seat. Yeah, it's really weird because the first hot and sexy seat, uh, the first shadow cast that I was ever part of, we never did any merch. So I never had an opportunity to have something from that. Um, it was probably It was probably once I had moved to New York – we really only did a lot of buttons at that point, and we had the old, old cast t-shirts, but they never really, like, mm, give me that. I think one of the things was at the uh, first convention I ever went to, the AC08 convention, uh, the shirts for that, I was just like, okay, this is the first con I've ever gone to, I've got to pick up something that, like, helps me remember it, and that, like, I'm going to wear forever, I don't think I've ever worn it since, but, like, had to pick one of those up. Um, and it, it, it's weird cause it's, it's more about the event and what I remember about it. I probably couldn't even tell you what was on this shirt. Um, but that's, that's one of those that like walk in the, walk into the, uh, the event hall and I'm just like straight to the merch table. We're going to get ourselves one of these, but I mean, th this kind of like segues really, really well into the whole kind of point that we want to talk about today, right? Like if you're out there and you're maybe like looking to start creating merch for your local cast or maybe just expanding the existing selection of merch that you guys have there's a ton of options to you and just like with any kind of retail not everything is going to appeal to everyone and not in the same way so how do you really strike that balance right when you're considering a new line of merch for your cast What's the checklist that we should all be like running down in our head? Is it about price? Is it about logistics? Is it about making sure that it's original? Like, so when someone on RKO, right, comes to you, Fred, and says, I've got 50 ideas for new merch, like, what metrics are you using to narrow it down? So, like, what's going to make sure that you get the biggest bang for your buck? The first thing I think about is, what are you trying to do? 
with the merch? Are you, are, you, are you trying to fundraise? Are you trying to build awareness that, hey, you're a brand new cast and you just started and you want people to know that you're out there, right? So you, you want to like rep your show. You know, what are you trying to do? That, that's the first thing. The second thing then is, you know, you, you can talk about convenience costs, logistics, all that. It all has to be taken into account. It's, it's about what makes the most sense for what you're trying to do and what can you handle? So that's that's the overall thing. Like, okay, um, if you're a small cast starting out and you only have a few people, you know, your priorities, I've got to get AV up, otherwise we don't have a show, right? The cast members need to get situated, otherwise we don't have a show. They need to get changed, all of that. Okay, once all that's covered and we got the pre-show ready to go, okay, now what about merch? So what can you handle? Right. That that inherently is the first question you need to ask. Yourself. What can I handle before a show? Then you have to think about where can I store stuff? What how much do I need to bring it to a particular show? Am I at a venue that is like a home venue? So we don't go around. Um, RKO has a lot of road shows. That has to be a huge consideration for us. You know, we need portable stuff set up quick and just be ready to go at a moment's notice versus if you got a home venue, I mean, you're in like Flynn because, okay, well, we're here every week or every month or every quarter, and they're going to let us store some stuff here so we can just pull it out of a closet and we're ready to go. You need to take that all into account and figure out what you can handle. Yeah, I think that that's really great points because it, it's not just starting with a really cool idea of some design that you want to put on a shirt. It's what are you trying to do with it? What's the goal with it? Is it to make some money? Is it is it to build awareness? Like, you know, you're really super cool niche you know idea of that one shot of magenta where she does that one thing i mean that's not going to help people know about your new warm waters cast that you got out there or whatever whatever it is you know absolutely and inherently it's about okay what can i feasibly set up before a show if it's if i'm doing this huge show or if i know that i've got a run of several shows okay maybe hey that's a great idea it's unique it's original um, we're, we're willing to take a shot on that because we know we got seven or eight shows booked on the schedule, iced with venues. So we've got a great opportunity to sell through this stuff versus, all right, um, I, I'm going to do a seasonal calendar and we've got one show a year and we're going to sell that calendar at that show. You got one shot to basically get your money back out and get maybe get into profit. If that's what you're trying to do, that's risky. Right. Mm -hmm. So what's the right level of risk versus reward? And is it something that's going to translate for people? Excellent, excellent points. And obviously these aren't hard and fast rules. What works for RKO or New York or what works for a convention isn't going to work for every cast out there. But there are evergreen items that I think everyone has considered stocking at one point or another. Can we run those down, actually? Like, we're in a really weird spot here in New York. After the Panera Bread, we've essentially reset back to square one with, like, a lot of our merch. Right now, we are selling prop bags at our shows, and that's about it. I'd love to pick your brain on the classic items because even something like t-shirts have a lot of options. And it can be overwhelming if you're suddenly tasked with your cast's merch and you don't know where to begin. Absolutely. Let's run it down. Shirts are absolutely one of the first things that most casts invest in. But there's a lot of ways to make your life a little easier when you start thinking about Rocky from a retail perspective. I mean, and, and that's that's what casts are, are doing, right? Like merch is retail. So so shirts, what works? What doesn't? What should we all be kind of avoiding in this? Like it's really tempting to order 10 different sizes and styles of like a half dozen different designs, but... I'm pretty sure that that's just going to be an absolute nightmare. Absolutely. So this is where, you know, uh, a lot of people in the community might actually strongly disagree with me. I hate shirts. I hate shirts. Anything size wise, like it's just so difficult to manage because, I mean, you want to be inclusive on sizing. Most of your shows, you want to make sure you have a good assortment of sizes. I can't tell you how many people have come up to RKO at, at a show and been like, oh my God, you guys actually have a 3XL. Oh, you have a 4XL. Oh yeah, we, act we actually do. We want to be inclusive about this. But it also means that's just more stuff you need to manage. The key thing is you've you got to keep it 
under control. You don't want 300 different designs. Pick one or pick two. One design that's your primary design that you're that you're pushing at shows. And then maybe there's that new idea. Well, that new idea you can phase in and then phase out your old idea. So the way I approach it is like we want basically one shirt at any single time point. So that way it's manageable. Yeah, I mean, we we encountered this be, before everything shut down here. We had kind of phased in a second shirt design, um, but we were running them concurrently, right? We had our classic Eyelips New York shirt, uh, and then we have our Statue of Liberty logo. Fantastic design. We got a wonderful artist to do it. But at the end of the day, when we started running our numbers and looking at it, it just wasn't selling as much as the other one. And we're sitting on a lot of stock of it. And, you know, it's mm-hmm. it's one of those that it's kind of like, maybe maybe we should have taken this a little slower. And now that we're looking at bringing stuff back, we're going to start with that old classic because it's the one that we know will sell. Yeah, it's always a struggle, like what will resonate, especially for apparel, right? And it they take up a lot of space. They're heavy. Um, anybody that assisted me at prior conventions or prior events and sees us lifting bags of shirts around, those IKEA bags that you can get for like storage are amazing for shirts, et cetera. But, you know, you put 20 shirts in a bag. I mean, you're going to feel that. I mean, who needs a gym membership? We can just carry all that stuff around. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I mean, we had... I, I, that's the other thing. It's like half of our prop closet would be taken up with just bags of shirts, just bags of stock that's sitting there doing nothing but taking up space. Yeah, I know emotionally. I, I get invested in like, oh my God, that stuff is still there. Why isn't it moving? I'm, I'm, it is just this huge corner of like a wall of stuff and you're like, all right, I'm kind of done with this. It's like, it's a great design. It's it's amazing, but like we need to figure a way to move on here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this is all fantastic advice. And I know that we've been guilty of not heating it in the past. Like, just ask Meg how many extra, extra small baby doll tees with our alternate logo are sitting in storage. But something like buttons, I would imagine, is like a very different topic. I think everyone in the community knows that over at RKO, you guys specialize in those like super high quality enamel pins. They are lovingly designed by some of the most talented artists in the community. And your years of logistical experience has the manufacturing and sales side down to a well-oiled machine. But like for a cast that's just starting to branch out, is it just make some art and buy a button maker on Amazon? Like where would you suggest that people begin and how can they expand once they've dipped their toes into the pool? All right. So when it comes to buttons, I, I think buttons are tricky. So you can go one of two ways. And I've actually, I'm, I'm going to shoehorn into another topic in a second. But when it comes to buttons, get a cheap button maker at first, minimize your investment, test out a couple of items, or maybe there's somebody in your local community, reach out among artists, etc. Maybe they already have a button maker that's fancy, one of the more professional ones. And hey, work out something with them. Hey, can you crank out 20 or 30 buttons for me of these two or three designs? Do a test, see how it goes. There's a lot of people too, if you go on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist or whatever, there's always people turning over equipment and you, you end up saving money in the long run doing it at home. But on the other hand, if you order in bulk online, you arguably can end up with a higher quality product. It's less time. So what's your time worth? That's really what you have to ask yourself. Are you willing to be sitting at home for, you know, three or four hours before a show, punching out buttons and then putting them into the maker and putting them all together and then putting them in a box and organizing everything? Or do you just want to order in? Especially if you've got like a couple of big shows coming up and you you want a lot of inventory, then you're probably going with a bulk manufacturer versus if you just want to try something out find the cheapest equipment that you can test it out first or find a friend that has the equipment already and use them. And this sounds a lot like what we were talking about with t-shirts, right? Like don't Mm -hmm. go out there and make 700 different designs, every single character you can possibly think of, figure out what sells first, right? Absolutely. I mean, you can, if, if you really want to do buttons, quote unquote, the legit right way, then, I mean, you're looking at American button making machines. Um, I forget what, what the name of it is, but um, I think it's American button machines. But those, each, for each size, you need a separate machine. And they're like $300 a whack. Oof. So, and I've been at craft shows. Um, I, a friend of mine used to run a business and 
I was helping him out at his booth and it was a guy next to us and he was running a booth called uh, Sutton Button and he had a unique way of doing it. He just had a generic design and it was a targeted at kids, but you could see how this would work at a show too. So he had just like a piece of paper printed out and it was like, okay, come over, do your thing with your design, like do your art, right? And maybe it could be Rocky Horror theme. Maybe it couldn't be. You could do a million things with this. But do your thing. And then he'll grab the thing, punch it out, make a button right on the spot, sell it to him. Here's a dollar. He was making a lot of money doing that. He had a line. Hmm. You know, so you can do a million things with this. Again, it's a question of what direction do you want to go with it? Do you want do you want something fancy? Do you want something that's more like audience participation where somebody could, you know, kind of have a little button making station and, you know, just throw me a dollar, make your own button design. Here's a background Rocky Horror theme thing. And then you can do your own thing with it and make a button and leave the show with it. I love that idea. That's, I, I'd never even kind of thought about that. I mean, ob- obviously, you know, you're committing to having a cast member that can sit there or a crew member that can sit there and do that. But like, it's, mm-hmm. it's a great idea to, to, to bring that audience participation aspect into it. Um, mm-hmm. I certainly know back in the day, right? Like, and by back in the day, I mean, you know, 80s, 90s, you know, that kind of thing. There, a lot of casts really leaned heavily on uh, just kind of the mass market stuff that they could put on buttons, right? Pictures of the characters, the lips, like, you know, Rocky Horror, yep. whatever. Um, I'm curious about your opinion on this. Is that something that cast should kind of stray away from? Like, obviously, nobody on here is a legal expert. We're not going to tell you you're going to run into copyright issues or any of that kind of stuff using it. But, like, is that something that you're concerned about with the kind of stuff you guys are producing at RKO? Or, you know, what's what's the thought there? I think you're going down the road. You want original art. You want some sort of parody work. You want some sort of fun thing, your own take on it. Because, again, you're, you're also competing with eBay and Amazon and all the other online forms, Poshmark, Macari. I mean, people are reselling buttons they bought wholesale already. So how much of a market are you really going to have for the same thing that I can already get on the app. That's a good point. Not much, perhaps. Right? I mean, and, and even some of the more generic stuff, like Etsy's flooded with it, right? If you if you yep. go to Etsy and you search for Rocky Horror Lips, I mean, take your pick. There's six pages of buttons that you can buy on there. And and then how, how do you stand out among all of that? Like, okay, the, the people have a unique take on the button. Like, they did a black and white. But it's the same scene with Frank on the throne that everybody's seen a bazillion times. Okay, cool. I that I that's fun, but maybe I'm looking for something unique. Make me maybe I'm looking for something that's just, you know, also the audience member connects more with the cast that way. Like, oh no, this is our stuff. Oh really, this is your stuff? You you did all this? Oh wow, that's so awesome. Oh, give me four of those. And it's absolutely a great way to to foster engagement just within your cast, right? You know, maybe you've got an mm-hmm. artist who, you know, maybe they're a college student, maybe they're just out of high school, and they they don't have a lot of published, you know, work or whatever. Um, they're going to jump at that opportunity to, oh, you want me to draw you Frank as a duck? I can draw you Frank as a duck. I've been drawing Frank ducks for years, you know. And let's have fun with it, you know. Let let let's. Uh... Um, I forget who the artist was that did the um, the uh, Rocky Horror Time Warp graphic as hieroglyphics, right? It was amazing. Oh, that's cool. And it's actually spelled out in hieroglyphics. Like the, you got the Egyptian look and there's Frank as an Egyptian. I mean, it's an amazing piece and it's unique. I mean, that that's like, oh my God, this is awesome. This is this is amazing, and this is ten times better than what I could get on Amazon. Yeah, absolutely, and I know that's exactly you know what I'm seeing when I'm looking you know at the RKO booth and you know all these unique enamel pins that's got like Harley's amazing art on them and just Amen. stuff you've never seen before, and you're like, oh yeah, I do want a Marriage Maze pin. Like, oops, never really thought about it because it just hasn't been out there, and you know people haven't done it. So yeah, absolutely. So. Does the same advice apply to like patches, keychains, magnets, you know, so on and so forth? Or are there unique considerations there? There are certainly more difficult to manufacture than like a button maker at your kitchen table. So uh, patches, you know, you can find a local embroidery company that's willing to help you out. Keychains, I mean, if you really want to, you can go to Michael's and, you know, come up with your own design and and assemble it yourself or you can go more bulk manufacturing magnets are tough 
but they're good to have. I do have enough people that say, oh yeah, I, I, pins aren't my thing or patches aren't my thing, but I, I do like magnets. I mean, there's a reason why you go into every single retail store in New York City and, and what's the first thing that you see as you walk in the door besides like a cooler with water and beer or something. You see this huge rack of like magnets. I love New York mm-hmm. and here's a big apple. And I mean, and there's a bazillion of them. Why are they there? Because obviously there's enough of a market for it that you know, hey, it's a $4 item. I, I, maybe I'm not looking to drop 20 or $30 on a t-shirt, but $4 for a magnet, sure, what the heck? You know, you, you're at that price point where you're like, oh yeah, whatever, sure, I'll take two. I mean, it's cheaper than a hot dog at the theater, so why not? You just need to be cognizant of a lot of these things. They don't sell as fast as like your traditional buttons or uh, pins. So, you know, realize that they're not going to be something that you're going to sell a bazillion of. And so do you want to deal with all of that? And yeah, and definitely take that into account, you know, with how much you're stocking, right? You mm-hmm. know, like you don't need 500, you know, bulk order when you're selling for a show, you know? And and can you afford to do that, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm always concerned about what the sustainability of the community is as far as cast funding and and budgets and and you know do you have enough money to replace your tank when the time comes you know do you really want to tie up fifteen hundred dollars two thousand dollars in buttons or t-shirts or or keychains and then guess what we thought these would be amazing but they're not selling and good luck explaining why you can't buy a new spotlight because you're sitting Mm on (laughs) sitting on a hundred thousand magnets like They don't do much to show your actors, uh, but they, they, they let you stick stuff to stuff. That's right. <laughs> so I think a lot of what we came to on this, right, like find find original pieces that really stand out, that, that show your brand, and just be really aware of, you know, how much you're stocking, what stuff sells, and, you know, take it slow, use cheaper alternatives at the beginning, and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, really, really flesh out what you're trying to do with it. While we're on that topic, right, and specifically around original art, I think we've got to talk about stickers and posters and you know, bumper stickers, right, all of those paper products. I love supporting content creators in the community, and I think that original art is absolutely a fantastic way to do that, be it stickers or prints or whatever. But I have to imagine from, like, the the retail side of the logistics side, there's got to be a lot of pros and cons there. Like, what do you think about when you're curating paper products? So paper products are tricky. I mean, you've got to be real, especially with paper products, right? I mean, wrinkles, um, you can end up with stuff damaged very easily. It can get bulky or awkward to carry around. It's one thing, oh, I'll just grab an artist portfolio, you know, that somebody maybe had for sale on eBay. And I, I got some way to protect the work as it's coming into the show. But how are you going to display it? Do you do any outdoor shows? Because let me tell you something, talk to any artist or craftsperson, outdoors, humidity, paper, you know, if they do watercolors, I mean, oh my God. Yikes, yeah. Um, right? So you, you got to be really cognizant of that. Like, what if somebody spills spills a soda on your stuff, right? So, you know, oh, it, it's ruined now. You can't save it versus they, they spilled it on some buttons. Okay, life's going to suck, but you can rinse it out in the sink and... And you can basically salvage the work versus now the stuff's destroyed. So paper products are tricky. It can work. I would be hesitant to spend a ton of money on it or or to do something very specific, you know, like a poster for your specific show, perhaps not. Maybe you ear towards something more generic. On the other hand, if you can find like a local print house that can do a small scale run, and you do like four or five posters, you know, and you're looking to know, like, do something special. Print out four or five posters, have the cast sign them all, and then sell them at the show. You could do amazing at that. You wouldn't, you'd be amazed how many people are like, oh my God, this is awesome. Especially if you're doing a theme show. Stickers are tricky. You really got to check with your venue. Um, you got to get a, a temperature reading in the room because, Okay, the stickers, we sold a bunch of stickers. What if they put them all up in the bathroom, right? And then you leave and it, right? I mean, it happens. 99% of the time I haven't seen that, but you need to be aware. Like, it could be a risk. Like, okay, yeah. Uh, some And some venues just ban them. 
you know, there's some Comic Cons. Like I, I know there's some anime expos. Stickers are banned. They don't allow them in the building just because of that, because they've had issues in the past with people just plastering them all over the place. Yikes. I hadn't even thought about that. But I mean, it's, it's definitely because especially especially with stuff like your props and things that, you know, might be sitting out in the lobby for half of a show or something. You come mm-hmm. back out and suddenly you got 15 stickers on it. And it can work to your advantage, too. If you have like a cast logo and you do like some nice stickers or something, guess what? Part of your math should be I want extra so I can mark all my stuff with them. Mm. So that like you, there's a giant Archaeos army sticker on the side of the ladder. Like, OK, whose ladder is that? Oh, that's ours. See, because it's got our sticker on it. Or the spotlight, especially if you're in a venue and you share it with other organizations or whatever. We mark your stuff. Well, then it's an opportunity. Do some stickers. And then also you can, as part of your calculus, say, hey, I'm not just spending this money to just do merch. Guess what? I'm going to repurpose some of this. So if it doesn't sell, I can still use them to mark all my items. Absolutely. I mean, I know we did um, we did temporary tattoos for a long time. Um, they worked out really good. But... Part of that cost-benefit analysis was just like, we're going to lose a third of these just to the elements, right? Just to moisture yep. and this, and they stick together. And a, a lot of that was, okay, you take that into account. And, you know, all the ones that are kind of, you know, a little too crummy to sell, well, those are the ones that we give out to the cast for free that they can plaster on themselves for pride parades and, you know, for all this other stuff. So definitely that that alternate angle of like, all right, what's the other use for this if I can't sell them or if there are too many of them get slightly damaged or any of that kind of stuff? Yeah, you always, you always, in the back of your mind, you need to have a backup plan. Like, um, There's a lot of talk in the artist alley communities about like blind bags or grab bags. So if you got like dead stuff, you know, you can throw it in a bag and, and just, okay, so it's not a prop bag. It's just the bag of mystery. And for whatever reason, a lot of times people love that. Mm-hmm. I, they're, they're huge sellers at stuff like Comic-Con. You just see booths that are nothing but... Mystery box. Blind boxes with Mario mm-hmm. on the side of them or whatever. So definitely something to look at. And what about all the other stuff? Like all those things that cast members ask about. Bottle openers, pens, water bottles, coffee cups, underwear. Like just all of that. I think everyone has pitched these kind of ideas before. So what is your position on that stuff? Is it too difficult to stock? Have you found some unexpected items that sell like hotcakes? What are your vibes on this? Well, I'll tell you the unexpected item that that ended up selling like hotcakes was the enamel pins for us. We didn't really think this would be that big a thing, but it it seems it's it's obtainable art for people, right? I'm not spending three hundred dollars on this this unique piece. It's only it's only ten or fifteen dollars, I, I, and I can wear it, so it's wearable art too. So it kind of punches a couple of different categories. Some of these things like pens, water bottles, coffee cups. I mean, you got to really take a look at okay, how much storage space do you have? Um, coffee cups, water bottles gets really heavy. Where can can you display this? Are you set up to handle it? You probably want to curate what you have. And, but if you've got something and you want to take a shot, it's like, all right, well, the cast is really thinks this is going to be amazing. Okay, great. Well, let's do a thing internally. We'll like do an internal order or something like that. And everybody's going to want a water bottle anyway. So if I'm guaranteed on selling 20 water bottles, how many more do I need to sell to get my money back out at least? So then at least, you know, you're, you're agreeing together as a team, like, Hey guys, we want to make this happen. Okay. Well, let's make this happen. And, you know, is everybody willing to step up here and, you know, put a couple bucks into the pot on that to help us get to yes on that. So that way we're not relying just on the audience buying all these items. Okay. Hey, I got 20 or 30 captive cast members. They're willing to step up here and Everybody wants to make this happen. Okay, well, let's make it happen. And I mean, that's just a great way to take the temperature too. Like you've got 20 mm-hmm. hyper invested people. If only two of them are interested in a water bottle, well, maybe your audience won't be either, you know, and vice versa. If every single one of them is like, give me that, that underwear. Okay. Maybe that's an item that you can, that, that you should be bringing out to the audience. Yeah, absolutely. The, the underwear that Tesseracts have is an amazing idea. Um, and it's, it's well executed because it just... You're dealing with sizes, but it's a smaller item. It's light. It's easy to carry. And, you know, people just, oh, oh ha, it's a lark. You know, it, it's kind of funny. 
Uh, so your general audience members into it. But then you've got a lot of cast members who are like, I'm on that role anyway. Like, oh my God, yeah, give me that. Mm -hmm. Because I want it as part of my costume. So I, I think part of the takeaway for all of this stuff is, you know, the more you stock, the more you have to handle in logistic and just make sure that that's what you want to be doing with it. But up until now, we've been talking almost exclusively about kind of cast branded merch or stuff that you're bringing specific to your show. I've been wanting to ask you about this for a while, Fred. What do you feel about generic mass market items? I've been curious about these because particularly back in the day, that's just what a lot of Rocky casts only had for sale. Do you mean like like generic just Rocky Horror merch? Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of stuff like the official trading cards or like glossy character headshots, stuff that you could buy in bulk and resell. I mean, like Rocky Horror face masks or I mean, maybe I've seen casts that have copies of the Blu-ray available at their tables. Like, do you think it pays off to dive into some of that generic merch or are you just setting yourself up to hold a lot of slow moving stock? So for generic merch, I, again, you, you got to realize, too, you're competing with Amazon now, right? So... Um, you're competing with eBay. You're competing with Google, where I can I can just go on the app and order it, and it'll be there tomorrow. I approach that stuff cautiously. I would take a look at number one, how many shows you have coming up. Are you, do you have any mega mega shows coming up, right? Where you're going to have at least a few hundred people. Okay, so if you have that coming up, maybe it makes sense if you can find somebody that's willing to take it on do the work to find out, okay, is there a wholesale path to get this item? How can I get this item for my cast? It, can I get it at a reasonable price where, you know, at least, you know, I'm not making 50 cents on each sale because at that point, why bother, mm -hmm. right? Is it is it really something that's going to really drive things for you guys, right? It doesn't make a lot of sense to do this. Blu-rays, et cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, the cast could sign a Blu-ray or something, right? So you could take a off-the-shelf item and kick it up a notch by creating some tie-in with the cast. Like, you, you know, you could get it autographed or you, you could grab a pack of trading cards and have the cast autograph a couple of the trading cards as the character on the back or something like that. And then you're taking that generic item and you're kicking it up a notch and making it something unique and special. And that's a way to leverage it and make it something more amazing and also more of like a, not a heirloom item, but like a keepsake. Oh, I lost my virginity at that show. And I got the DVD signed by the cast and I'm going to keep that forever. I just went very quiet because that's a very clever idea. And I hadn't really, I never think about this, especially for shadow casting. It's, it's not a Broadway show. It's not a this, it's not a that, it's not any of that, but people don't care. They, they, they're just like, no, I went to see that thing. These were the people that I saw it with. And here's, here's the signatures on the Blu-ray cover that I got. And it, yes, I paid $5 more on Amazon, but uh, all right. You know, interesting. That's a really interesting take. I like that. Yeah. Cause at the end of the day, what you're doing is, I mean, we're presenting interactive content that's differentiated from a lot of stuff out there. And yeah, it's not a Broadway show, but on some level, I feel like this is where the future of the movie theater industry is headed to some degree. You can't just show a movie and count on the crowds to show up anymore, um, especially, you know, post Panera Bread. So you need to find some way, especially if you're a small business owner, differentiate yourself and look at what your community theater is doing, right? They're doing talkbacks. They're doing, uh, you know, meet the cast. Maybe they're doing some unique, you know, workshop thing or whatever. Our community kind of falls in the same zip code. We may not be on the same street, but we're definitely in the same zip code as that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that that's something that um, not a lot of casts have explored, right? That option of the, mm -hmm. the, the extra stuff. It's kind of we, we have it down to they show up, they get in line, we do the pre-show, they might stop at our merch table. They're going to just run through the movie and then kick them back out the door. Hopefully they'll pass by the merch table on the way back out. But there's all that other stuff that community theaters and especially that is doing that really creates a more of an experience that frankly at the end of the day can drive more merch sales if you just listen to some guy talk for 10 minutes about what it's like to be magenta uh you might want him to sign something and well you might want to pay four dollars for it so you never know what kind of a connection that you've made with an audience member well our frank at the time maddie you know somebody wanted her autograph 
you know, yeah. <laughs> she, she was just blown away by it. And it's like, oh, oh yeah. I mean, that happens sometimes. People are just like, yeah, you connected with me so much on stage. I just found this an experience. Can I get your autograph? And, you know, in another way too, the, the audience, you can take a page from what bands do, et cetera. The audience is supporting you. Like that, this is their way of showing their support to what you're doing, to all the work you're throwing out there, to all the rehearsals, the blood, the sweat, the tears, this is their way of showing I support what you're doing out here. Absolutely. I think that there's a massive wealth of information that we've gone over related to the actual items that a cast can sell. But Fred, as you've said before, it's not just what you stock, but it's also how you present it. And all of the logistics of effectively managing a small store at your weekly show. So what are some of the things that you found on the logistics side that casts should get a handle on before they start expanding their offerings? I mean, the first thing is storage, right? So are you constantly moving to different venues like RKO is, or are you doing something more like, hey, we're here every week. If you're there every week, you got a lot more options and you can get a lot more creative with displays and such, um, depending on what you have for storage. Get on some of the local artist forums, walk around at your local craft show, see what other people are doing. Everybody's constantly tinkering with their displays. I know I am. I mean, sometimes, you know, the back of my car looks like a disaster zone because I've got all these random things that I'm like playing with. But, you know, think about how you're going to display stuff. Like, are you going to make it up high? Don't just lay it all flat on a table. That sucks. You know, it's a good way to start out you know, and, and do a test, but you've got to get stuff vertical so people can see it. So those wire cubes that all the people at Comic-Cons use, there's a reason they all use them because you can set them up, break them down. They're flexible. You can grab a bunch of binder clips and hang art off of it or hang merch or pin up a t-shirt or whatever pretty quickly and inexpensively. So that's one way to go. The other way to go is see what other bands are doing like rock bands that tour you know especially your smaller ones they are local community guys and gals those people know what they're doing because they're counting on that merch sale for the show so what inspired me was um is a band called the lights out and they had a video called build a merch case to make Optimus Prime jealous. And there was this crazy thing that folded up and it had a lighting panel and it had a bunch of CDs and they would just leave it there with a donation box. And so they'd run their show and while their show's going on and they're on stage, they've got this thing with a thing of CDs and they're like, you know, you'd be amazed. People just put money in the donation slot and then they take a, a CD and they leave and it's selling for us even when we're not there. And they do really well with it. So I'm like, that's brilliant. You know, how do you organize stuff, right? Color code your t-shirts. RKO does Roy G. Biv. So we bag them all up. We put color tape on them so we can immediately tell what sizes we have. Uh, payment, you've got to take credit cards these days. You're going to lose 30, 40, 50% of the sales on the table if you can't take a credit card. Get a square account. Mm. You can get the equipment for free or for 10 bucks. Just set up an account get started especially if you're trying to suss out if this is even feasible for you guys like hey you know make sure that you're setting yourself up for a good test if you've never done merch before besides prop bags and you want to try something out make sure you can take credit cards so that way you're going to get a really good test and say hey so how do we do here did we do did we do ten dollars well well we didn't take credit cards seven people would have bought something but you couldn't take a credit card so you lost all those sales. Did you get a really good test out of that? No. Venmo is the big one for us that everybody asks to pay with now. Hard no. No? Hard no. I, I've heard horror stories. I cannot personally confirm it. Mm-hmm. I've got a Venmo account personally. I have heard horror stories of people, quote unquote, in the industry that do like artist alleys, comic cons, all that sort of stuff for a living, losing thousands of dollars Ooh. on Venmo from getting hacked or or whatever. I don't know the full story, but it's enough to be like, I am very, very hesitant to go down that road. It's like, we take credit cards. um, We can do Apple Pay with Square. If you get the reader, that's like 40 bucks. That will check most of the boxes. Venmo, it is an open discussion out there around 
is this really feasible? A lot of people use it, but you're taking a risk. That makes perfect sense. I mean, plus, if you've got a Venmo account, it's linked to a card that you could probably accept anyway, right? So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. So just give me the card. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, you know, you need to vary your setup to what you're doing, right? Maybe you just have a, a box that you flip open at a venue. You can just grab a cheap suitcase. That's what a lot of bands do. They put a little string of fairy lights around it battery pack for 10 bucks because you need light don't assume that where you're going to be there's light and people can see your stuff you need a light just to have you know battery powered ones are cheap make sure you got signage we take credit cards my friend used to do craft shows i couldn't believe he had like seven signs up we take credit cards do you take credit cards (laughs) <laughs> so you know it's like uh, yeah look here 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 um and prices like most people won't maybe walk up to your booth make sure you have a good sized price sign mm. so people can kind of see what stuff's for sale how much it is and then determine okay is this something in my budget or not most people won't even bother walking up if they don't see the price yeah the last thing you want to do is lose a sale because you know you, you're one guy who's vending is talking to somebody and you know actively engaging and somebody's standing there waiting to find out how much your buttons are you know mm-hmm. so I, we've covered a million things here and i i think this is kind of where it can start to get really overwhelming for people right like suddenly your simple merch setup of like we're selling prop bags for five bucks is now like gone to a button board and a bag of t-shirts and and then you take it further and now you got a full retail display that maybe now you're setting up a bigger ordeal than half of what your props are for the actual film even past that we all know it doesn't stop there beyond your local show like you personally have a ton of experience managing the logistics for things like RKOCon and for other big you know events Expanding just out of merch, is it kind of the same thought process, you know, where you're starting to look at that stuff, where you're having to treat Rocky more like a business when you're ordering programs and signage and posters and flyers and like all of that kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you got to do the math. I mean, it's it's a lot of work. Like, ironically, like Roy talks about the sweet spot, our cast director, right? I mean, sometimes you, you'll find math's weird. Like you can get 250 of an item for a dollar a piece, or you could get 300 of an item for 35 cents a piece. And you're like, well, why, why would I order the two? I'll just order the 300 because it's actually going to be cheaper overall. But, you know, promo materials and, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, what do you have room to store again? Do you have a place to display it? Do you have people that are willing to like hand out stuff or whatever, right? Um, before you spend a ton of money on flyers and posters and that sort of thing. Do you have some place to put it? Like when you get to the venue, because now you might need to bring an easel to put the poster up, right? So now you can, can make sure you got a checklist to make sure you don't miss something. Banner stands are great for that. Like get a graphic designer, put up a banner stand. Um, Rocky for her quality. They were at RKO Con 2019. Rocky for Equality does the show up in uh, Maine. They do the Rocky Horror Show, not the Shadowcast, mm-hmm. the play. Okay. And they have the best banner stands I've ever seen. And it gets the point across. And you can get a banner stand made for like under $100. We're, we're starting to think about doing some of that for RKO as well. Because you can just, you have this little over the shoulder thing, you pull it up. There's a big, huge sign that's like six feet tall. Um, and then you close it up at the end of the show and you go. Not hard to navigate. It's not heavy. It doesn't take up a lot of space, et cetera. Again, you just got to realize like, okay, how much time, effort, and money do I want to spend on making all this different stuff? Mm-hmm. And am I getting what I need out of it? I mean, one of the things we did for RKO when it comes to um, just getting engagement with the audience is um, we spend money every month on a text to join email you know so instead Mm. of having the clipboard or whatever hey text you know to rko em and uh, you'll get a link back on your phone sign up for your email list and that way we're kind of starting to build a audience list independent of facebook independent instagram independent of everything that i can just directly reach out to people that really like what we're doing I mean, that's huge. And guess what? You know, you don't need to deal with signage or anything else. You just throw something up on your screen if you can and say, hey, just text this number, get on our email address. Don't count on Facebook to tell you what's going on. Hear directly from us. It's 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 a great tool. 
Yeah, I mean, and those are the hyper engaged people that you can direct market to then, you know, that you can, hey, we got new shirts. Do you want to try them mm -hmm. out? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think we can all see why a lot of this stuff can be like extremely daunting for the average cast just looking to get their branding on some shirts. But it doesn't have to be like you don't need decades of experience and spreadsheets living in your brain rent free to get started. But it certainly doesn't hurt either. So wrapping us up here, we've all seen a lot of Rocky. We've all visited quite a few casts during our tenure. Is there some merch item that you've seen recently that just lights up that inner collecting dragon and goes, I gotta have that? Or even more flatteringly, that's a great idea. I've got to steal that for my cast. Mine personally is the uh, the asshole and slut underwear. Mm, yes. That a thousand percent. Uh, right? Like, um, I, I'm pretty sure I mentioned it on the podcast at one point, And then the very next week, Harley came up and gave me a pair. <laughs> because I had talked about them, and I was like, this is, in, in my own humble and correct opinion, it is the best piece of Rocky merch, bar none. I feel like there are so many casts that, like, are like, haha, we should do underwear, and then they, you know, because they think it's funny, and then they actually went out and did it, and I absolutely love it. I think it's a fantastic idea. They're they're wonderful. I've even used them for shows when I've forgotten my black underwear before. They work. It, it's one of those things that you see and you go, oh, I could I could see that being in in my hot topic or in, you know, in my 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 local, you know, alt store. Right. right. Where you're just like, oh, it, it, it's so simple and straightforward. And uh, we got to steal that idea. It's so good. What about you, Fred? Was there a, there's something other than those underwear that there was just like, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I can't for the life of me remember the name of the cast, but um, we had a nice thread going on one of the shadow casting forums uh, a while back and people were kind of just sharing their merch. And I was like, there was a cast, I think it, uh, Indiana perhaps, and they had like glasses or like hip flasks with like some sort of like illustration on it i was like that's amazing mm. that's amazing idea of course bringing glasses etc is kind of painful too but you know i i know i know some uh from doing craft shows with my friend there's some vendors on the circuit that do like laser etched glass work etc decanter sets and stuff and uh make a business out of it and they just travel the country selling glassware um with illustrations etched onto them you know, fandom related type stuff. And it kind of punched some of those points. And I was like, that's an amazing idea. And I'm, I'm just waiting for them to to eventually get to the point where they have this for sale online, because I'm definitely going to be a customer. Yeah, I, I love that. And it, it's one of the things that like, we didn't really broach on it too much today. Those like high ticket items, right? Those like, oh, yeah. I, it's always such a risk, right? Where you're investing in something that you're expecting to sell for a hundred bucks or, you know, even $50, right? For something that's, mm -hmm. you know, high end like that. And it, it's, we haven't seen a ton of it in the community, but when I do see those specific things that casts have, that's always the thing that, that I lock onto and I'm like, oh man, I, I guess I do need a croquet set or, you know, whatever <laughs> random thing that's just Trebuchet. like, right? Like I've never seen one of those before and wow, Castle sure. Hotel. Right, exactly. It, I mean, listen, I would give like infinite money for an Oakley Court Lego set, like just literally <laughs> infinite money I would just throw at someone to assemble a 3000 piece, you know, Oakley Court Lego set. But it's stuff like that that's, you know, it strays really far into, like, art and all of this kind of stuff where you're, you're talking about high-ticket items. But those are the ones that always just light me up with just, like, oh, man, I've never seen that before. And honestly, it's the reason that the damn underwear <laughs> is such a thing because mm -hmm. you just go, I've never seen that before, and it's so obvious. Damn it, why hasn't anybody done it? And now they have. So I, I love that stuff. You heard it here first, folks. Aaron wants to buy your underwear. Uh, well, yes. <laughs> and our show. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> and that's our show. We want to thank Fred for joining us on air this week and being a wonderful and beautiful co-host. And as always, we'd like to thank our writer, Jacob, and our editor, Aaron, from Tennessee. We appreciate all your work. If anyone has a question that they'd like us to answer on air for our Ask a Question segment or some community news that they'd like us to talk about, 
or even just a cool story to share with the community, you know we'd love to include it in our show. Just go to our website, that's rockytalkypodcast.com, and fill out the contact form to tell us all about it. If you're enjoying Rocky Talkie, please help us out by rating, reviewing, and subscribing to the show. It helps to make the podcast more accessible to new listeners, which really helps us to grow the show. And if you want even more Rocky Talkie content, you can check us out on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, all at Rocky Talkie Podcast. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. See ya. Uh, 76. <laughs> so good. <laughs>and someone just decided to die outside <laughs> let me make sure they're stopped <laughs> the, the the death has ceased before i start talking